Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update on this Wednesday, December 8, 2010 edition. My name's Tom Fresh, your host. You're listening to LibertyRadioLive.com. Thanks for taking the time out of your hectic schedule this morning to join the broadcast and listen in. My pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, I have the, the, the pleasure of introducing my guest this morning, the producer and director of two recent DVDs. You'll find both of them promoted on my website at, at inquisitionupdate.org. The first of which is A Lamp in the Dark, uh, a video that I've discussed at length on this program, and a new one that I'm familiar with now, thanks to Chris Pinto, The Hidden Faith of the Founding Fathers. It's my pleasure to introduce to my, guest, to my listeners this morning my guest, Christopher, or Christian, excuse me, Christian Pinto. Welcome aboard, Chris. Hey, Tom. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm very pleased to to have you with us, and uh, I I wish we had time to share of all the things that we've talked about on the phone uh, recently, but we only have an hour. Uh, before we get started on the video, I would I would appreciate it if you please give us a, a brief personal testimony so my listeners get to know you a little bit. Praise the Lord. Well, you know I began I was actually raised Catholic. I was raised in a, in a Catholic household. I would call my parents really traditional Catholics rather than, you know, very devout. Um, but I was raised up, you know, went through Catholic confirmation and so on, First Holy Communion, all that stuff. Uh, people who come from a Catholic background know what I'm talking about. Went to catechism and so on. And uh, when I was a teenager, I uh, went through the Catholic confirmation and somehow or other felt very convicted to read the Bible. But somehow or other, I should uh, I should read the whole Bible all the way through if I'm going to take this whole thing seriously. And so I read through my Catholic Bible at the time, which was, uh, some people might remember it from the 1970s. It was called The Way, and it was like a, a modernized youth Bible. Mm-hmm. And even there, as I was reading through the scriptures, this took me several months to get through it, but as I was reading through it, I noted that over and over again, God makes it very clear when he speaks to his people that he doesn't want them to add anything to his words, and he doesn't want them to take anything away from his words. Yeah, Uh, it's really amazing. It's really amazing that they didn't take that portion of the scripture out of the way, right? Right. right. (laughs) I mean, today, of course, I, I would not in any way embrace a translation like that, but even there... You know, even with the place that I was at spiritually, uh, I could see that God, you know, in his commandments makes it clear that we're supposed to serve and worship him according to what he's commanded and not according to man-made ideas or doctrines. And uh, so I I remember reading through this Bible, and I kept waiting for the part where the Pope would show up and, you know, that somebody was going to go live in the Vatican and where the nuns and the cardinals were going to come in because uh, I had never read the Bible all the way through before. Mm-hmm. And so I keep reading book after book, page after page. And, of course, you get to the end of the Bible, and there is no mention of the Pope. Uh, there is no Vatican that Jesus or St. Peter went to live in. Uh, there are no nuns. There are no cardinals. Uh, there is none of the tapestries of Rome. And uh, so at that point with where I was at, I decided I could no longer be Catholic. And, of course, that, you know, that caused a bit of a fuss with my family because I stopped mm-hmm. making the sign of the cross at dinner and so on and uh, no longer, you know, subscribed to Catholicism. Now, I wasn't a born-again believer at that point. Uh, that would come an, uh, quite a few years later. And uh, I pursued a, a life, uh, really pursued a career as an actor and then as a writer and a director and, and an independent filmmaker for a number of years until I was about 30 and, uh, of course, pursued it from a very secular viewpoint, uh, trying to make myself rich and famous so that I could, you know, have a, have a, a big Hollywood dream-type career, which is what I was after for many years. But uh, as, when I was living in New York and I was about 30 years old, uh, the Lord turned my heart and made me realize the vanity of what I was pursuing and that it was literally the relentless pursuit of a, a vain dream that would ultimately end up nowhere. And that's when I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and uh, mm-hmm. God opened my heart and revealed His Son in me, uh, and then I just became deeply immersed in Bible study and uh, seeking out what God wanted me to do now as a born-again believer. Uh, and uh, I had actually given up all of my ambitions about being a filmmaker or an actor or any of that stuff. I put it aside, and then at some point realized shortly after that uh, that God had given me certain talents for a reason and that he wanted me to do something with those things. And so I began to hunt about and try and figure out what the Lord wanted me to do. And uh, it was several years later when my walk of faith was really just about going to church, interacting with other Christians, and I would study the Bible and read different books and try to learn as much as I could about being a, a Christian and how to walk for the Lord. And then, uh, one day, some friends of mine gave me a, uh, a video called Rock and Roll Sorcerers of the New Age Revolution. And it was done by uh, a guy named Pastor Joe Schimmel, who's out in California. And this video, in the video, Pastor Joe is presenting, he's talking on the music industry. And I had heard about things like this in the past, and I just kind of always thought they were, you know, extremist kind of presentations. And I watched this, and Pastor Joe is, of course, quoting a lot of scripture, and he's quoting a lot of prophecies about what's going to be happening in the last days, and then exposing uh, how you know Satanism and the occult was working through the music industry, and he's talking about things like the New World Order and how these you know spiritual entities are working through people to try and unite the world as part of. Uh, what we're warned about in the book of Revelation, that there will be a last day kingdom of Antichrist upon the earth. Mm-hmm. And uh, that while you know this is working in many different areas of life, he was going to show it to us through the music industry. And uh, I thought I was going to watch 15 minutes of this thing and then just give it back to my friends and say, oh, yeah, I watched. Yeah, I was fine. Uh, and uh, I ended up sitting there for almost four hours uh, watching uh, you know, this information that I'd never heard about before. But that compelled me to start my own investigation into prophecy and how prophecy is being fulfilled in the world. And uh, then I just really felt led of the Lord that what the Lord wanted me to do was uh, to start making documentaries that deal with uh, prophecy and history to try and convict people and show them that the Word of God is true, God's prophecies have been coming to pass and are coming to pass even in our day uh, and that, you know, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19.10. And so that's really the focus of our ministry, Adullam Films. Uh, I'm a Christian filmmaker. I make films for the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and try to find a whole variety of ways to uh, persuade people and convict them uh, to believe the gospel. Well, I'm familiar with A Lamp in the Dark, as I said in the intro, and now familiar with Hidden Faith, and it's obvious to me that the Lord has been preparing you for this mission, this ministry, for a long time, practically all your life, and it comes forward, it, it, it comes forth from your work. And I praise the Lord for uh, raising you up to, to join the many, many voices now that are coming forward and telling the truth about this Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. And uh, I highly recommend your videos. There are links uh, for my listeners. If you're interested in Chris's videos, you can go to my website at inquisitionupdate.org. Look for uh, the images of the DVDs, Hidden Faith of the Founding Fathers and A Lamp in the Dark. It'll take you directly to the Adullam uh, Films website, and you can order them direct. Uh, Chris, uh, it's a marvelous testimony. I don't want to dwell on this long, but uh, I, I, I'm familiar with many Catholics who have become disillusioned. They realize that the Catholic Church is not the Church of Christ, as it claims. And many times, the Catholics who finally leave the Roman Catholic Church give up on Christianity altogether. And it's, uh, at least from my perspective and the research that I've done, it's a miracle of God that you came out of the Roman Catholic Church but but clung to Christ. 
and are usable for His purposes. And I praise the Lord for that. I've, I've said so many times in the discussions that I have here on Inquisition Update and also my avocation in amateur radio that when the truth is finally known and people begin to comprehend what's going on, some of my best friends will be Roman Catholics who converted to Christ. And uh, well, I'm definitely, thrilled by you know, one, your testimony. Well, one of my favorite ways to, because I come out of a Catholic background, and we still got members of our family who cling to the Church of Rome. Um, yeah. One of my favorite ways to describe uh, the Protestant Reformation, which we talk a lot about in A Lamp in the Dark, but it's to say that the Protestant Reformation happened when Roman Catholic priests began to read the Word of God and believe it. And then when they began to proclaim the true words of God from the Scripture, that's what brought about the Reformation. I mean, this is true of John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, Martin Luther. Uh, all of these men were Catholic priests. Uh, and they got hold of the Scriptures, and really, the Scriptures got hold of them. God got hold of their hearts and, I believe, changed them into new creatures in Christ. And then they began to lift up a shout against Mystery Babylon, the great harlot uh, that we're warned about in the Scripture. Uh, in Revelation chapter 17, and I believe other places as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You study those, you know, all, you compare all the Scriptures, Old Testament and New, that are warning about spiritual Babylon. Uh, it's very clear there are many warnings from God. Well, certainly we have a timely warning from God in your most recent work, The Hidden Faith of the Founding Fathers. And like most Christians, I've been taught all my life that America is a Christian nation, that it was founded on Christian principles. But you have done an intense study into the personal writings of some of what we've come to regard as the founding fathers of this country, and you've re you've uh, you've exposed a truth that contradicts the traditional belief about the founding fathers. Would you like to talk about your video? Oh, absolutely. I mean, first, one of the first things that I like to do when I talk on this subject matter is to to put a distinction between the you know, the early Puritan pilgrims who came over at Jamestown and then at Plymouth in 1620, uh, who I believe were generally Christians, the, the, the pilgrims especially at, uh, at the Plymouth uh, Plantation. If you read the history of the Plymouth Plantation by uh, uh, William Bradford, who was the chief governor there for some 30-odd years, it's very clear this was a Christian man. Uh, and the general belief of those who were with him was Christian. But even Bradford is writing about the influence of paganism, the influence of idolatry, uh, even among the English settlers who came there. They, they were not all Christians. They had tares among the wheat, as it were. Um, but nevertheless, the early colonies, I think, generally were built by Christian men and women who built their towns, their cities, and their schools, and they dedicated them to the gospel of Christ. That's very clear in their writings and their examples. But 150 years passes until you get to the American Revolution. And the revolutionaries were a different uh, breed altogether. They were not Christians. And the Christians who lived at that time did not even think they were Christians. That's one of the things that I try to, to point out in the film, is that uh, I, I show at some point modern comparisons, and I, and I ask the audience, you know, how would it be if you, if you could go 200 years in the future and see a presentation and have somebody tell you that Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi were born-again Christians who were promoting Christian values in America? You'd be up in arms. You'd be furious. You'd think, wait a minute, those, they, they weren't Christians. And the Christians of our day don't believe that these people are Christians. And so it was with many of the revolutionaries. Uh, Dr. Ashbel Green, who was the congressional chaplain for eight years under George Washington, uh, who lived through the revolutionary era, uh, he says in one of his quotes that the prevailing view of the Philadelphia clergy, the Christian clergymen, their prevailing view was that most of the revolutionary patriots, military and civil, were infidels. 
Yeah. That they were people who rejected the true gospel. They were not believers. They weren't Christians. Um, Dr. Green, in fact, one of the quotes that I think is just very insightful is when Dr. Green writes about Thomas Jefferson. After Jefferson had died, his private papers were all published. And Dr. Green was still alive, and he read them. And he talked about how Jefferson was a hater of the gospel and that he had hatred for Christianity, that he was a reviler of Christ. And he said the name of Jefferson would be held in abhorrence by all American Christians to the end of time. I mean, that's a literal word-for-word quote from Dr. Green because of the very hateful and wicked things that Jefferson said about the Bible, about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said the teachings of Christ were full of stupidity and falsehood and, and so on, that the apostles were dupes and imposters and buffoons. Uh, I mean, all of these uh, wicked ramblings against the Bible and against the faith of Christ. And yet somebody like David Barton will go into our churches and try to find ways to present Thomas Jefferson as though he were some kind of God-fearing man who in some way maybe perhaps supported Christianity, when in fact the exact opposite is true. And so uh, in the film, you know, the film is three hours long, and that's just one example. But there are many others from, you know, John Adams, of course, Benjamin Franklin, uh, George Washington, even, even though Washington was certainly more moderate uh, than some of the others. Uh, and, and, of course, Thomas Paine. We spend a lot of time on Thomas Paine simply because it is underplayed the amount of influence that Paine had over the American Revolution. It is written on Paine's tombstone, without the pen of Paine, the sword of Washington would have been wielded in vain. And that quote's attributed to John Adams. Uh, Then another quote from Adams is, history is to ascribe the American Revolution to Thomas Paine. People don't realize that Paine, who had written Common Sense, was also, and he was the leading oracle of the American Revolution. It was because of Paine that they fought the War of Independence. Now, what had happened was there were skirmishes that were going on between the you know, Continental Army and the British, but they, they had not declared independence from Britain until Paine came along and wrote Common Sense. And that's what led to the Declaration of Independence and, and them saying, hey, we're going to break from England entirely. We're not going to be uh, you know, under English rule anymore. We're going to be our own separate country. Uh, and it was Paine and his writings that really inspired that and then fueled the revolution from then on. Well, it was only after the revolution was over, then Paine goes and he writes his book, The Age of Reason. And he exalts, you know, the, the pagan goddess of reason, which is really the human intellect and so on. And he totally denounces Christianity as being a fraud and a fable and you know, the Gospels are all corrupted by these cult followers of Jesus who made up these stories about miracles and all this other kind of stuff and totally denounces it. But the reason I spend so much time on pain is to show the pattern of what pain believed. And then we go into the writings of the other founding fathers and show that even though they weren't as extreme as pain, they wouldn't have come out and, you know, denounced Uh, necessarily to the same extent publicly. Nevertheless, in their letters and their correspondence, we find a through line where they all generally agreed with these ideas of the Enlightenment and the ideas of human reason above the wisdom of God in the Bible. A complete departure from true, true Christian belief in faith, Uh, in Christ and grace, uh, the grace of God and salvation by grace through faith. And uh, really, generally, if they did not outwardly revile Christ as an imposter, at best he was just a good teacher and that that he taught a good system of morality but they stripped him of his deity. They stripped him of his redeeming power. 
They stripped him of the e efficacy of his blood that he shed for our redemption. And uh, they've reduced him to a mere man at best. That, well, that's, is, yeah. that is clearly revealed in your video from, from their own personal writings. Yeah, over and over again, not only from their own personal writings, but then it's further confirmed. Like when you get into George Washington, Washington doesn't come out in any of his letters and say that he doesn't believe Jesus is the Son of God. Now, he never confesses Jesus as the Son of God either. Uh, but he praises the great architect of the universe of Freemasonry. That was Washington's impression of God, the great architect of the universe. Um, but those who knew him, his pastors, his ministers who knew him for over 20 years and had lunch and dinner with him and, and, had, and knew him for years, their testimony collectively is that Washington was an unbeliever, that while he had respect for the Christian religion, he simply did not believe in the Jewish Christian revelation, as Dr. Green puts it. And again, Dr. Green you know, was the congressional chaplain for eight years. He had lunch with Washington on a weekly basis, and he, he, he confessed to his family that after, you know, that he knew it to be the case that Washington was, he was very respectful. He was, you know, he was just a reverent man in general with how he conducted himself toward others. That's the reason so many people thought he was godly was because of his moral behavior. And he was very courteous. Uh, and uh, everybody thought he was a very valiant, patriotic man, but that he simply did not believe the gospel. My so. general impression after watching this video is the quote-unquote founding fathers did their best to just pay respectful lip service to Christ, but they they renounced they renounced him and the faith in Jesus. They did, and they believed, which was the prevailing view of the Enlightenment over in Europe, that Christianity was really an enemy of freedom. Yeah. That's the that's the thing, because in the Bible, the Bible doesn't teach religious liberty in that men have the freedom supposedly to believe about God whatever they want to uh, the Bible says God says the first command I am the Lord thy God ye shall have no other gods uh, God says in the Bible that we should bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ that's from the Apostle Paul and so over and over again we are compelled in every thought word and deed to do all as unto the Lord and this would have been the teaching, this was the teaching of the pilgrims. Uh, this was the teaching when Harvard University was founded in 1636, you know, that uh, truth for Christ and the church, that was Harvard's motto. And that every student earnestly consider that the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. So Harvard didn't have any problem declaring this is the purpose for you being here. Your purpose is to know God and the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, because that's going to lead you to life eternal. That's right. Chris, we've come up on the break. Stay tuned. We'll continue our interview with Chris Pinto when we return with the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on LibertyRadioLive.com. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on LibertyRadioLive.com. Returning to our discussion with our guest this morning, Christian Pinto, producer and director of the most recent video that I highly recommend, The Hidden Faith of the Founding Fathers. If you want to know the truth about the founding of the United States and what tenets upon which the Constitution was written, I'm afraid you're going to discover that it's not what we've been taught. Chris, uh, we've been taught that the United States is a, a Christian nation, and it was built on liberty. Yet our Bible says that we are to choose this day who we will serve. The Bible says, if God be God, then worship him. But if Baal be God, worship him. The Bible doesn't preach religious liberty. We, we've grown up with the concept that religious liberty is a Christian tenet, and I can't find it anywhere in the Scriptures. 
Yeah, to me, that's the it's it's one thing to say. I mean, you know, as a Christian, certainly, I am thankful that the Lord has given us, if you will, a time of uh, rest, uh, at least rest from persecution in this country, uh, and enabled us to labor for His sake and and to speak freely the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, you know, I don't I don't want to give the impression that that I'm in any way unthankful for what God has done in America. But to say that religious freedom, in the way that it's interpreted in the Constitution, is a God-given inalienable right, which is how it's described, is a deception. It gives people the impression that God has given all mankind the right to believe about God whatever they want. And that's the reason why in our country, uh, that's what has happened to people. Most people in this country who profess some form of Christianity... And it said, according to the statistics, some 80 to 85 percent profess to be Christians in some way here in America. And yet most of those people, other studies have shown, do not believe the gospel. They don't believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes unto the Father but by him. They don't necessarily believe in a literal heaven and a literal hell. Uh, they don't necessarily believe the true gospel. And it's because they've been given the impression that their God-given right is to determine about God whatever they want, and that God has supposedly given this freedom to man. Uh, and that's not a freedom that God has given. Uh, God has commanded that we all believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. First uh, John 3 and verse 23 says we're commanded to believe on the name of the Son of God. Uh, that's what Paul testified to the Athenians. when They had all these different gods and goddesses in Athens, but when he testified it to the Athenians, he spoke against their gods, and he said, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now he commands that all men everywhere repent. Uh, that's the command that we as Christians are to give to the world, that God commands that all men repent of these other gods these false ways of salvation, uh, these gods that cannot save, and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He is the, the true God and the Son of God. Um, and salvation happens only through him. That's the message of the gospel. And it's that message that has been corrupted through the founders of the American Revolution. Why? Because they were not Christian men. Uh, right. And so their ideas about God are not biblical. They're against the Bible because they themselves were against the Bible. And the, Christian, the, the Christian founders were, almost without exception, Freemasons. And in my study of Freemasonry, I've discovered that Freemasonry is an ecumenical organization. That you, The only requirement is that you be free and not a slave, which is another subject altogether. But that you must believe in a supreme deity. And you can call him Buddha, you can call him Muhammad, you can call him chicken soup as long as you believe in a supreme deity. And you may, there are many pathways to heaven. It's kind of this ecumenical all skate that, that Freemasonry teaches. And something else that I'm discovering is the ecumenical movement is a, is is appearing to me to be a global mirror image of what Freemasonry teaches, and I'm also discovering that Catholicism rightly calls itself a universal religion, and 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 there, there's so much clamor in this country, and I'm thinking particularly of uh, of David Barton and. Uh, Oh, Glenn Beck on the Fox News program saying we have to get back to our Christian roots. We have to get back to our Christian roots. But what are the Christian roots that they're talking about? Are they talking about the gospel, or are they talking about another gospel? Well, what I believe they're doing is they're using the name of Jesus Christ and Christianity as kind of, they're using Jesus as kind of a front man for their ecumenical universalist message. Because of David Barton, David Barton in his writings, he shows that he knows what the true gospel is. But if he really believed the true gospel, and he re really believed Paul's warning, 
that if any man or an angel preach any other gospel, let him be accursed, then he would be compelled to warn Glenn Beck, who's a Mormon, who thinks that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer, and Mormonism teaches a works-based form of salvation, that you go to heaven because you're a good person. You know, well, and, Mormonism, Mormonism, in the study that I've done on it, is nothing but the religious form of Freemasonry, an openly religious form of Freemasonry. Right, right. And, and if I could, Tom, very quickly, a sure. number of the key founders, it's disputed and debated whether or not a number of key founders like Jefferson and Adams and, and others were actually Freemasons, Thomas Paine as well. But what, one of the things that I show in uh, this documentary, The Hidden Faith of the Founding Fathers, is I walk you through what these men believed, and then I walk you through what Freemasonry believes. And so it, it, it and, and you can see, anyone can see, that the beliefs are identical. The same deistic, universalistic ideas of Jefferson and Adams and Paine are all embraced by Freemasonry. And they were during the time of the American Revolution. So it doesn't matter whether they were official members of Masonry or not, they held to the same ideas about God, you know, and this yeah. universalist concept of God, uh, where, where men have the freedom to think of him what they will. So uh, that's, that's the case, but, you know, I really think that the connection here, and I know that you've been, you talk about it on your radio program, and you and I have talked about it over the phone, uh, the real connection here is Rome, Rome right. and the Jesuit order. This is uh, something that I bring out in the film, that this doctrine of ecumenical or universal theology and what is called religious freedom was actually developed by Rome, and they attempted to push this in England back in 1688 through King James II. And what happened was, when they made this ecumenical declaration through King James, uh, the purpose of it was to try and give rights to Roman Catholics in England. Because of uh, all the conflict with Rome and the many assassination attempts of Queen Elizabeth and then King James and all of the attempts by the Vatican to try and overturn Protestant England and bring it back to Catholicism, what had happened was a series of laws were erected to limit the activity of Catholics in government right. and to prevent them from holding certain offices because the English knew from experience that Catholics are, you know, they were, they were being declared by the Pope, excommunicate. You're excommunicated if you don't fight to try and overturn this Protestant government. You know, you're going to hell unless you fight to try and kill and overthrow that Protestant king or queen. And so this gave Rome like a standing army in England uh, that were constantly trying to work to overthrow the government. And so that's the reason why the English had these laws that limited the activities of Catholics. And so King James comes along, James II, and he declares himself officially to be a Catholic, and then he comes out with this Declaration of Indulgence, it was called. And it, what it did was it removed any boundaries legally from anyone because of their religious view. And to make it just for Catholics would have been too obvious. So James and the Jesuits, according to J.C. Ryle, the, the great church historian from the 19th century, he, we, we show you how he documents this, um, what they did was they made it for all religions. So anyone, you know, if, if you were a Muslim, if you were Jewish, if you were Catholic or Protestant, of any religion whatsoever, you could have an equal place in England. And the English knew what, what they were trying to do. You know, they wanted to remove these laws so that Roman Catholics could get into positions of authority and overthrow reformed England. So they rejected it and they deposed King James II, kicked him off the throne, and William of Orange comes in. Well, James and his followers then fight a series of rebellions against England from 1688 onward. And these were called the Jacobite rebellions. And many of those Jacobites, they kept fighting against England over and over, and they kept losing, 
And when they lost, their fugitives would flee and come to America. Well, many of those Jacobites came to America, and they settled in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and those Jacobites formed a Scottish Masonic Lodge there, Fredericksburg Lodge Number 4. And it was at that lodge that they initiated George Washington into Freemasonry. Mm. And George Washington's close advisor was a Jacobite rebel named Hugh Mercer, who left the continent right after the final Jacobite rebellion comes to America, and he becomes good friends with George Washington. And it is said to this day by the Masons that Hugh Mercer was Washington's closest advisor. It was Mercer who had recommended that Washington cross the Delaware when he did. And he was also one of Washington's generals. From that lodge, that Masonic lodge, that Jacobite lodge, came eight Revolutionary War generals. And you can go online, go to Fredericksburg Lodge Number 4. You can read about a lot of this stuff there. Uh, but what... You know, what many people don't do is they don't make the connection that the Scottish Jacobite Masons were the ones who formed that lodge, and surely their influence, I think, would have affected George Washington and the other generals because they had this enmity toward England, and then they, then they promoted the universalist idea that King James and the Jacobites had been fighting for for almost 100 years. And then so in essence, so in essence, what England failed to do through, or what uh, the papacy failed to do through Pope or um, King James II, they accomplished in this country. That's what I believe. In fact, I learned this from a uh, from a researcher, a Jewish researcher up in Canada, um, a guy named Buff Perry, and he's he's not a Christian. And he certainly, I mean, he's, and he's not necessarily against masonry or, or any of it. He actually kind of agrees with a lot of the ideas of the Enlightenment. But uh, he's, you know, spent years researching masonry and so on and the influence of the Jacobites. And he calls the American Revolution the fourth Jacobite rebellion. There were three Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Because the, the, the dates of the rebellions were 1715, 1719, and then 1745. And then you have 1776. Sure. And so he believes, and I, I, I asked him quite directly, I said, are you saying that the American Revolution could be called the Fourth Jacobite Rebellion? And he said, absolutely. No question, because those same Jacobites came and they formed the core leadership of the American Revolution. And when they won the war, what's the first thing they do? They, they create a constitution that promotes their idea of religious liberty that dates back to 1688. What and what that, that gives, what that gives in a new colonial period where, where Bible-believing Christianity got a, a respite from the persecutions of Europe, the papal persecutions of Europe, what they achieved for this country was religious liberty for all, which gave Catholicism the freedom to prosper to the point that it is today a controlling entity in our government, a controlling entity in our churches, a controlling entity in our banking, and, and virtually every area of vital concern for this country is now dominated by Catholics. And they're under the same, they are under the same pressure from the papacy as they were when uh, under England in essence, what what I see this is when the when the when King James II gave those that uh, decree that you you mentioned earlier, the name escapes me right now. But the de Declaration at that time, of Indulgence. Yes, yes. At that time, the Catholics became a vast fifth column that that would threaten the Protestant uh, the Protestant. Uh, control of Great Britain. And what we're seeing today is the same thing now that Catholicism gained the right and the freedom to prosper in this country. Now they have also likewise become a fifth column in this country to overthrow the Protestant heritage of this country. 
is, is that your assessment? It, well, well, I, yeah, I definitely believe that is the reason why biblical Christianity has been, you know, under attack for the last 200 years. It is the, the leaven of universalism that was sown into the Constitution is simply spreading and growing. And this is what Christians don't understand, in my opinion. This is my observation. Well, uh, I share that opinion. Is that what's all this stuff on abortion and gay marriage and uh, kicking the Bible and prayer out of schools uh, and, and all of it, it all stems from the doctrine of universal theology that was sown into the Constitution. That's where it comes from. And just like leaven sown in, you know, uh, in bread, it's going to grow and it's going to rise as it bakes in the oven. So it is with doctrine. And, uh, you know, Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And then the, the disciples understood it was the doctrine of the Pharisees. This doctrine is like a leaven, and it is leavening the whole country. It's growing and spreading, and that's why Christianity has to be put out. Because all the gods of the nations are demons, and the true God is not going to abide peacefully with a bunch of demons. Uh, it's just not going to work out. Uh, and, and God makes it very clear that it's not going to work out. That's why Jesus said, Do not think that I came to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace but a sword and division. And that sword is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Uh, and God's Word does not unite the nations of men. It divides them. That's right. Those that would serve the Lord and those that would not serve Him. Uh, and so that's why I think, you know, we as believers... Our duty is to preach the gospel, not to go out and fight for everybody's equal rights and this kind of thing. That's not what the Lord has put us here for. Uh, I mean, if God is a point, I do believe there's no higher power but of God. Praise the Lord. And I believe that. that ex- yeah. Uh, I don't well, we can certainly we, we can certainly refer to the Bible and realize that there'll be no religious, lead, uh, religious liberty in the kingdom of heaven. Right. There'll be one Lord and one people. And I think that that's what's so important for us to communicate. That's what Paul communicated 2,000 years ago. He didn't show up to the Athenians and tell them, well, I've come to let you know how much I respect all of your gods and goddesses, and I just you know, want to really fight to the death so that I can ensure your right to worship these idols uh, and keep worshiping them. Uh, that's kind of what many Christians have been led to believe is their duty. Their duty is to make sure men have the right to worship idols. That's not what the Lord sent us here for. That's Our right. duty is to preach the gospel uh, and to give the good news to the nations of men, as well as God's warnings, you know, to teach men both the goodness of God and his severity, as Paul says. Uh, you know, goodness for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but severity and judgment and condemnation for those who reject him. Yes, and I always point on this on this broadcast the insidious deception called ecumenicalism. And I mean, I've described it this way, Chris, maybe you wouldn't, but I look at it this way. Uh, there are only two kinds of churches in this country. What's becoming apparent to me is that there are only two kinds of churches in this country. Those who are ecumenical and those that will be. And I, I, I'm, I'm constantly reminded of the passage in Revelation 18.4, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not also of her plagues. We can't be a part of this ecumenical global all skate. We have to take a stand. If we want God to defend us, we have to repent of ecumenism, we have to repent of universalism, and we have to put our foundations on the rock that's Christ and take a stand for Him and suffer whatever consequences come our way. Amen. Well, what, what's happened, part of the reason I made this film on the founders is because it seems like to me, especially in light of Glenn Beck and David Barton, uh, and for those who, you know, I, I, I always run into this. Whenever I talk about Thomas Paine and the founders, 
people will send me emails and they'll say, oh, we all knew Thomas Paine was a, was a heretic and this kind of thing, uh, as if they're trying to marginalize his importance. But when Glenn Beck began this Tea Party revolution of his, what does he begin with? He began by hiring an actor to show up on his TV show as Thomas Paine and to preach to the American people what they need to do and be concerned about. Then he publishes a book called Glenn Beck's Common Sense, based on the writings of Thomas Paine, and he uses that to further his whole Tea Party movement. Okay? Uh, so, so to try and diminish Paine's influence, it's not diminished. It's there. He was the oracle of the American Revolution, and many of his ideas uh, are, are the philosophies of the founding fathers and the, found, and the founding documents of America are largely based on his writings, which many of these uh, guys who are promoting patriot Christianity, they don't want to admit that. They have a really hard time admitting it, even though all the early Americans understood it, or most of them anyway. And while certain of the founding fathers, okay, uh, so, so to try and diminish Paine's influence, it's not diminished. It's there. He was the oracle of the American Revolution. And many of his ideas uh, are, are the philosophies of the founding fathers. And the, found, and the founding documents of America are largely based on his writings, which many of these uh, guys who are promoting patriot Christianity, they don't want to admit that. They have a really hard time admitting it, even though all the early Americans understood it, or most of them anyway. And while certain of the founders opposed pain, because he was really calling for the eradication of religion, none of them, if you read what they said, none of them actually opposed, or at least the major, the ones that I've seen, actually opposed the things that he said about the gospel. None yeah. of them stepped up and said, hey, Pain is wrong. Jesus really is the Son of God. The Bible's not a fable. It's God's true inspired word. You know, guys like uh, John Adams and Jefferson and those guys, they never confronted him that way. You know. That's remarkable. Glenn Beck uses as his champion Tom Paine, Thomas Paine, the most virulent anti Christ, anti Bible figure of the entire Founding Fathers, mm -hmm. and everything seemed to flow from Thomas Paine, and yet he, he's the centerpiece of, of Glenn Beck's program. Right. Right. It's stunning. It's really stunning, Chris. And what's happened, I feel like, is what they've done is they've taken the mask of Christ they put it on the face of the Founding Fathers, and they're using this as the bait to draw Christians into this ecumenical army, yeah. okay, while at the same time keeping it open enough so they can bring in Muslims and, and unbelieving Jewish people and anyone who, who ha has some kind of faith and a higher power, you know, as God, whatever, they, whatever God means to them. Uh, but they believe in traditional values, they should come and join the ecumenical army and take back America, supposedly. Uh, God's people have to be careful who they get in league with. It looks so appealing. They use this thing, we have to get back to our Christian roots. They're not getting back to Christ at all. Well, you know, Paul warned us that in the last days perilous times would come, men would be lovers of their own selves, and that they would have a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. And that's the founders, and that's what this ecumenical movement is about today. Uh, yeah. It's presenting a form of godliness, but it denies the power of godliness, which is faith in Christ. Chris, we've come up on the end of the broadcast. The hour just blew by. I want to tell my listeners one more time, if you want a copy of this video, The Hidden Faith of the Founding Fathers, go to my website, click on the image, take you directly to Adullam Films, and you can order the video. It's my pleasure to host my guest, Chris Pinto, and I hope and pray that you'll see fit to come and speak to us again. I'll be talking to you about that. Thanks, Chris. All right, brother. God bless.